Good morning, everyone, and welcome in to another episode of the Found Generation podcast, a podcast for young people. Joining me today is Pat Muldowney, the senior partner manager slash sports publisher lead at Spotify. I don't know what any of that means, Pat, but you used to be my boss at The Ringer, so it, w- it would probably be uh, recommended to not interview your boss, but now uh, that we don't work as closely together, uh, I feel like now is time. And and I especially want to talk to you today because I feel like I am in a position in my career right now that you were once in maybe 10 years ago. I kind of feel like the path that you were once on is the path that I'm on now. So I really want to have you on today just to rack your brain about a couple of things, talk about your experiences in your career, what's going on in the media landscape as a whole right now at Spotify and other networks. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. Uh, thank you for joining me. Just let me ask off the bat, how are you, sir? Uh, I'm great, Troy. Uh, Good. It's an honor to be here. And and let's let's be honest. I don't know that I was never technically your boss. I always saw us as co-workers and now we're just buddies. Yeah. Yeah. I've absolutely loved getting to work with you and your team. I uh, usually don't do this, read off the credentials of the guest of my podcast, but I feel like it is you are it is worthy of being shared here. So you have this is your this new fancy job title you have. Congrats on the new job title, by the way. It became official as of a couple of weeks ago. You've been at Spotify since 2021. However, let's remember that Spotify acquired the ringer in 2020. Oh, oh I'm, yeah. I'm, no, no, no. Okay, yes. okay, 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 okay. Uh, your LinkedIn resume better be updated because I'm ripping straight from there. Uh, so ringer was acquired by Spotify in 2020. So you've technically been... You know, you were at the Ringer uh, 2018, the choir. So you've been at Spotify for several years now. Before you were at the Ringer in Los Angeles, Fox Sports in Los Angeles for four years, where you worked in social media. Before that, you were in lovely Bristol, Connecticut at ESPN, working various production roles. I, I say all this because I want to ask you after I've just said all that, Spotify. Fox, ESPN, the biggest of the big. Do, does that sound real to you? It's it's honestly still crazy. Uh, and ironically, like, you know, a big part of my new role uh, is, you know, working with some external partners in the sports space, uh, you know, representing Spotify and, and trying to build a relationship there. And, and so often I find myself kind of giving that quick little run through, of, you know, worked at ESPN for a while, worked at Fox Sports, because um, the one thing that I've learned uh, and, you know, as you know, is uh, having been in the industry now, there's like six people that work in sports media and we all know each other. Uh, so you're never more than like one degree separation from a friend uh, when you're when you're meeting somebody new. And that's honestly been, um, you know, th- as, as cool as it is for me to have those uh, names of employers on my resume and on my LinkedIn, uh, the, the best part of it has been the ability to network at places like that in this industry. It's just been something I'll never take for granted. Well, you've gotten yourself to an incredible place in your career. Um, you're truly one of the best at what you do, and, and I'm thankful for for your friendship, for your mentorship, and, and everything I've learned from you. And so I want to ask you, you know, at some point you make a switch in your career from being, a, a, you know, in the weeds, you know, in, in our field, in production, you're in control rooms, you're making TV shows, in my case, you're making podcasts, and then at some point you're ready to make a transition. You're ready to switch to to manage people, to lead people, to be a resource for other people, to take yourself out of the day-to-day, sometimes mon- monotony of production work and think bigger picture. When did you know you were ready to take that step? I, I mean, I'm glad I have your number because as soon as I hit that point, I'll text you and let you know. Um, it's funny, I, you know, I was just talking to some friends about this recently, and there's a weird thing with how corporate structure works. It's like you, you know, you bust your butt to be the best at what you do, where you do it, and you keep grinding, and you're like, I want to get that promotion. I want to work towards what's next, and we have this idea in our head that to to grow and to obtain more power and money and, and responsibility, we have to manage people. We have to. But you, what you don't realize is like all of a sudden you, you you do get that opportunity and one day your company's just like, hey, awesome job doing everything we brought you here to do. Starting tomorrow, you have a different job. Now, we're not going to train you for it, but you're also responsible for other people's career development. So good luck. Congratulations. And, you know, I, I do think 
you know, it's changed. Uh, I know it's, uh, I actually just got, I love newsletters now. I, I love your Substack. I, I read it all the time. Um, but Morning Brew sent out, uh, included in one of their emails earlier today, there was actually a section near the bottom. It was promoting one of their products and not to give them, you know, no free ads here. But it said, are you a new manager that has no idea what you're doing? Join our management training course. And it was 2015 when I uh, was at Fox Sports, or no, 2014 uh, when I was at Fox Sports and I moved into management. And really for me, it was just a situation of the, the manager and senior manager above me on the team that I had come to join uh, both left the company. Uh, right after the Super Bowl that was in New York City that year. I think it was the Seahawks Broncos. Um, so I had only been working there for nine months, 10 months at the time. And management above me left. Uh, social media was still compared to where we are right now in its infancy. Uh, and I had, you know, good relationships internally that I had already built in Fox in my first year. And I had the opportunity to move up uh, into a management role there. And overnight, my coworkers became my direct reports. Uh, and it, it changed a lot of the way I approached my job, but in no way, shape or form did I feel prepared for it at the time. Uh, I kind of had a little bit of a like panic, let's learn uh, existential crisis where I just started buying many of these books on my shelf back here or about men and just trying to learn. Um, so I, I don't know that you were ever fully prepared to make that shift in your career. Um, but I think it's just a matter of whether or not you're willing to do the work once you're there. When you did make that shift haphazardly, what were some of the, the growing pains that you experienced? Uh, you know, I, I think one of the big things is, so what was that, 2014? So I was 32 at the time. Um, yeah, it, it, I know this is the found generation. I obviously am the lost generation. Uh, <laughs> there's no hope for us. Um, but, you know, so I was, I was in my early 30s. But overnight, I had to like sort of shift where I had to start approaching work where my, my MO, since I had started my career at ESPN, was always like my coworkers are my friends. And sort of overnight, you know, there becomes this change where – you are responsible not just for you know evaluations, but also helping people develop their career. And you can't have that same relationship socially that you would uh, when it's somebody that you're sort of in the trenches with day in and day out. Uh, and then you know, so that was the first most tangible effect for me. And I still maintain great relationships. I'm still to this day uh, talk to many of the people that I was uh, managing at the time at Fox Sports, uh, and I have great professional relationships with them. I hang out with them socially outside of you know the industry. But I think the second part for me was my career development was now no longer the only thing that I was responsible for and was having an eye towards the future for all of them. And, you know, not building that for them, but helping them manage their their growth. How difficult was that to put on the back burner, your own personal development for the sake of others? You know, especially doing what I was doing at the time, like working in social is like the hardest part for me was like uh, stopping the doing of the day to day. Uh, I would, I was such a terrible micromanager at first where there would be tweets that would go out or an Instagram post or a Facebook post. And I would be like, guys, that's not what I would have said. That's not what I would have done. We should have done it this way. I, I'm the only one that knows how to do this right. Because at the time I was running a, an account where I was the sole voice uh, externally of social for that account. So it was kind of like it had become me to an extent. Um, so that was, that was a really hard detachment to make where I had to sort of just step back and let them you know they're all amazing at what they do. I, you know, I, I, the, the most important, the, tr the most stressful thing as a manager is hiring because you screw that up, then you're paying for it every day. Uh, I really lucked out with the team that, that we brought on board. Um, but taking that step away uh, from actually doing the work and uh, delegating was definitely the hardest thing. Uh, but in terms of, you know, it was honestly the, the shift to focusing on managing a team's development versus my own. That was actually like probably a little bit easier for me because I had such uh, imposter syndrome about my own ability to be a manager at the time. I wasn't concerned about immediate growth for me. I thought I had already gotten to a point that I maybe wasn't prepared for. Uh, so it sort of really shifted my perspective on how I approached my day to day. In your definition, what is a good leader? Oof, what a question. Um, you know, I think, I think really what it comes down to is Somebody that is, you know, I'll, and I'll speak specifically from like a management perspective. Um, I, I think a good leader, a good manager is somebody that genuinely is attentive to the employees, to their direct reports, to their team. And I, I won't say, I'll say that that also prioritizes the team's development, not necessarily more so than their own. 
because at the end of the day, we're all responsible for our own careers. Uh, but really somebody that doesn't just tell people or their team or their direct reports what, but tells them why. And I think really explain having a team that has a good communication and an understanding of why decisions are made or why they're not performing to the level that you would hope or why you think they're doing a great job. Because I think even saying, hey, great job can feel a little empty. But if you tell them, hey, great job, you know, Troy, I really appreciate that you stayed up until five in the morning this past Saturday editing this Ringer MMA show that never ended. Uh, that to you is an understanding that I'm not only appreciative of what you're doing, but also I have a full understanding of the sacrifices that you're making to get the job done going above and beyond. And I think it's really little things like that that can go an incredibly long way. And if a team feels cared about and feels, you know, cared about is is a dangerous, <laughs> a dangerous way of framing it because I don't love the we're a family here mantra uh, in terms of uh, a corporate environment. But letting people know that you're at least aware of the work that they're doing and why you think they're doing well or, or why you think they have room to improve or what they can improve, I think is important. So you used to work in social media at Fox, at The Ringer, and the social media landscape has changed so much, so much in the last five years. Can you kind of take me back to when you were working in social media? Because this was right around the the transition into influencers dominating social media. Can you kind of give us a little social media history lesson and tell us how these how influencers on social came to be like the thing that we're all consuming? You know, I think really what happened is the way that this industry is set up, specifically the way that the functionality of these social platforms are set up. Incentivize, we incentivize attention and that attention is then monetized. So we're the end product, you know, as the users, as the consumers. At some point, you know, because Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, it was a very, obviously a very different place in the early teens of this past decade. And I think we just build up this inherent feeling that any corporation or brand, at the end of the day, they're just trying to sell us something or buy our attention. And that's, I mean, that's true. That I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean the content's bad or it's not worth consuming. But when you think of the engagement that a tweet from, say, just using brands and, and people that we have no affiliation with, say NBA on TNT could put out a, a highlight of a game, of a post that's full HD, they clipped it off and uh, it's great, it's very brand safe, it maybe has a brand attached, whatever. Worldwide Wob, Rob Perez, who I worked with for a little bit at Fox Sports, he's one of the leading voices in social media. People are like, oh, that's just Rob. So, of course, I'm going to retweet that. I'm going to respond to him. Josiah Johnson, another one in NBA Twitter. I, I think Ariel, the way that Ariel Hawani approaches his social, it's Ariel can put out the same thing, same thing that like BT Sport puts out. It'll be the exact same content, but because it's coming from a person and not a company, we just feel we have more of a connection to it and less of like, oh, he's trying to sell me something. And I honestly think that that's the biggest difference. Um, I think it was easy to sell. It was easier to sell advertising when the place that everybody's attention was going was a newspaper, a television, or a radio station. Now there are a billion destinations for this attention. And I, it's, it has changed uh, this industry more than we ever could have imagined over the course of a decade. And it's going to continue to change as we go forward. So at Spotify, we've just you know, in the past couple of years, really leaned into the whole influencer thing, signed an exclusive deal with Call Her Daddy, Alex Cooper, very recently, Anything Goes with Emma Chamberlain. I'm curious to know, you know, you, you've, you've talked to some of these people, you've been in the rooms of some of these people, meetings, or you've heard from them. What are kind of some of the common traits, characteristics of these influencers slash creators that you see that, that make them successful on social media? I haven't necessarily, I have not, I definitely have not been in any of the rooms with any of these people. What I, the, my, my feedback on this will be strictly from a uh, consumer perspective as somebody that has been, uh, you know, a Spotify user since, I don't know, when did, 2009? I don't know. Uh, it, really what it comes down to, and I think it's very similar to the way that Ariel brought his show back uh, with SB Nation. Uh, I think we've seen, you know, a lot of moves, like Mark Titus just went, he had been the ringer, went to Fox Sports. Now he's at Barstool. All of this, what it comes down to is individuals that are, that are able to captivate and hold an audience. If people care about you, you can then take that and it provides value somewhere else. So I think that's really all. It's people that have built an amazing connection. Look at Emma Chamberlain. Uh, you know, 
I'm much older than Emma. I did not grow up watching Emma's videos on YouTube. But when I see the community that cares about her and it could be a video of her just like cleaning her apartment, it's they're going to watch every second of it because they love her as a person. Uh, and I think it's just a connection that's different than anything that's existed in the past. I love asking this question to people who work in social media because it's kind of a dirty game. And it's 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 dirtier now than when it was when you were in it. It was still dirty, but it's dirtier now. And I'm referencing documentaries like The Social Dilemma. I've read books that are similar to that as well. Where basically, as you said, Facebook, Meta, Twitter, TikTok, they're all vying for our attention. They are designing their apps with all these little subtle things that we don't really notice, tricking us. Out- our brains, literally getting into the the hard wiring of our brains to get us to stay on these apps for as long as possible and keep us from going outside and keep us from socializing in person because they want to ultimately sell us ads. That's how they make money. Did you ever feel a sense of guilt working in social media, knowing that your work was therefore supporting these platforms who do not on a moral basis, necessarily have our, the consumer's best interests at heart? I didn't, honestly. Uh, you know, I, I was lucky that, you know, pretty much everything that I've been working on in this space on the content side uh, has been designed with the the goal of entertainment. And one thing that is true, uh, that I truly do believe in, is that specifically in the world of sports, uh, we use sports as a disconnect uh, intentionally. So I do think often that when people are seeking out, you know, memes or, uh, reaction videos or videos of highlights. It's because one, they care about the thing that's being talked about, but two, you know, they, they want to step away from the the nine to five or, or the stress of their family, whatever it may be that they're dealing with. And this is a thing that can bring people joy. Um, you know, I, I don't know that the content that's created on any of these platforms really, uh, would be able to fix any of the, the issues that, that you've, you know, point it out. But I, I actually don't fully believe that it's any different than how entertainment has always worked in the past. You know, when you watch a, a sitcom, there's a reason the final block of the show goes straight into the next show because they don't want you leaving. When you're listening to the AM, FM radio, when the top of the hour hits, you're going to get 15 straight minutes of music because they assume people are doing things on a regimented schedule. And then at 15 and at 45, you know you're going to get some commercials there because they think that maybe that's more likely. There, I guarantee you there's somewhere there's research shown that has said that's what, more likely a window where people are just going to be driving and consuming. And everything in, in terms of the entertainment space uh, historically has always been geared towards uh, you know keeping people's attention. I think the biggest difference we have it in our pocket now, which obviously is a big difference. Um, but I think it's really each of our own responsibility. And I think we could all learn a lesson from you in detaching and, you know, taking a step back. And it's a personal decision that we all have to make. Uh, you know, junk food is readily available every second of the day. You have to choose not to consume it. And I feel the exact same way about social media. That's a really good way to put it. I, I'm going to steal that line at some point. <laughs> I'll have to credit you. Uh, lastly, on this subject, You've worked with a lot of very high profile uh, talent over the years. In 2023, what would you say are the keys to creating successful content, whether that's in the form of, of podcasts, of YouTube channels, of, of social media? What, what, are, what are the keys? It's a great question. You know, the way that I approach social media is like the whole job, the whole thing. And this goes for you with this podcast. This goes for ESPN running, you know, Omar running the sports center accounts, whatever it may be. The, the whole job is how do I make people think about or talk about my thing when they're not thinking about it or talking about it? And we need, you just need people because we're, we're drowning in content. I, you know, I, I know you're not a movies guy. I watched almost all the best picture stuff. That just meant I fell behind on some of the TV shows I was watching, which meant I had some podcasts to catch up on. Uh, and I spend time scrolling on Instagram and Twitter. So I, I think I, this is, this is no, you know, hidden secret or anything, but like capturing people's attention and being unique, I think is the most important thing. I genuinely think being funny is the most, like is the one of the most effective uh, strategies across any sort of social media content creation. Uh, not everybody has that. I don't necessarily have that. I am one of the least funny people I've ever met. Um, but you know, it's, can you 
find humor in the things that you're talking about. And then I think the other thing is being able to take, uh, you know, the when you look at something like Succession, which is going to dominate conversation on Sunday nights over the next 10 weeks, however many weeks, if you're a sports brand, if you're an energy drink, if you're a car company, how do you channel some of that back towards you? How do you make it about, how do you take the conversation that's happening around something else and use that, whether it's through humor or irony or sarcasm, whatever it may be, to bring that conversation back to your brand? Uh, and I think there's a lot of really smart, creative people doing it. Um, but I also think the the last thing I would say is take breaks because you kind of get lost in the sauce. And, and as you know, it can be a, a high burnout job. And I think you need to step away from it to come back to it to really understand what's hitting and, and what connects with you. A lot of what we've been talking about is really rooted in kind of how the the younger generation is consuming slash creating. So I want to talk about that a little bit. I call this podcast the found generation because in the 1930s, the the kids, in, I'm a history buff, so I'm going to nerd out, the the post-World War I uh, got, you know, mostly young men who were fighting in World War I were then like just went through this massive war. They've seen all, all types of things and they don't and they think like, oh, my God, the world is ending like they were totally directionless. And so they were called the lost generation because th- you just had all these 24 year old men just fresh out of war, no idea what to do with their lives, no sense of direction, the lost generation. So I, th- I thought about that plan where it's found generation. We, you know, yes, we are. Our generation is undergoing severe anxiety, severe mental health crises, suicide rates sadly are the highest they've ever been among this age demographic. But with that said, we have way more opportunities than you did growing up. I mean, the the phone itself, like my career is basically based on on this thing. And anyone, you don't need to go to college anymore. You can break down all of the traditional middlemen. It's truly amazing and inspiring. And so I want to talk about kind of this generation and as a person in in leadership and in hiring, I want to ask you, what are the biggest strengths of the the kids just out of college, 21, 22, you know, all the way up until 30 and the biggest weaknesses? Well, let's I'm an optimist, as are you. Let's start with the, the good stuff. What are they really good at? Uh, you know, I, I think self-awareness and and I think that just the way that you just laid all that out uh, to an extent, really understanding uh, in, a, in a way that even I didn't, you know, 15 or so years ago that, and, and you know, maybe this is a little contradictory coming from like the em- employer perspective, but I think knowing that your job is what you do, it's not who you are, uh, really is something that I've noticed uh, from the younger class uh, of workers that I've worked alongside or been lucky enough to hire here at Spotify uh, and, and even a bit at Fox Sports and, and knowing that there's a separation there and, you know, knowing that you can still find success and continue to grow without having to, to define yourself by your job. Um, that is something I am envious of. That is something that I wish I had early in my career. And it's definitely something that I, I very much admire about, uh, you know, younger generation entering the workforce now. Where are some of the biggest weaknesses? Where, where do we struggle? What makes you want to bang your head through a wall? <laughs> uh, nothing, I would say nothing that extreme, but man, you know, and this kind of goes back to, to what we were talking about on the social media side of things. You know, the comparison is the thief of joy thing. You know, we really, I think there, there is this pressure to have a LinkedIn update every eight months. Here's my promotion. Here's my new job. I just saw somebody took, I, is it just me or did like everybody go to Europe in the last eight months on vacation? <laughs> you, you lived there for a while. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, when you see this and then, you know, especially in this industry that we work in, uh, you know, I made $30,000 in my first job and that was my dream job in Bristol, Connecticut, working at ESPN. And I thought, you know, once I get that first job, I'm going to have endless money. I'm going to be making real money for the first time. And you realize quick, like if you came in to work in this industry specifically to get rich, I'm sorry you made the wrong choice and you should you should revisit your life decisions. Um, that doesn't mean you can't make a good living and you can't make a comfortable living. Um, but, you know, I think you have to know that, you know, you, you bring patience along with this and do not, you should not be chasing promotions every six months or so. It, they'll come as you earn them. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be striving for career growth and development. Um, but, you know, I do think the 
pressure that people feel to grow and grow immediately and 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 kind of climb that ladder uh, is is greater now than it was even when I started my career. Yeah, it's very similar criticism uh, to what I've been hearing for years regarding young people is that we're entitled, is that because, you know, we're so used to getting everything so fast via Uber Eats and Netflix, like getting everything that we want at the drop of a hat that we don't know how to wait for things. Do you find that to be the case? I, I don't want to speak in generalizations like that um, because I don't think that's fair to to everyone. Um, I've certainly come across some, you know, whether it's coworkers or uh, how, whatever my relationship was with them professionally that have certainly seemed to feel that way. But I've also come across others who were just eager to learn and, and weren't necessarily uh, brought no sense of entitlement. Um, I do think there are we get used to things and can certainly take some things for granted at times. Uh, and I think, you know, somebody like me, I'm very lucky. Like I said, my first job out of college, I got to move to Connecticut and work at ESPN. So many of my friends, their first job was in Youngstown, Ohio, or, uh, you know, somewhere in West Virginia, or had to move to Iowa in a small, uh, a, a small regional affiliate. And that was their entry point. So now I'm like, oh yeah, I could always just go to New York and work for the week and go up to the arcade on the 70 whatever floor of World Trade Center and get my great lunch and free coffee. Um, there, we just need to always remind ourselves that we're lucky to have the things that we do um, and not let that that entitlement creep come in because I, I don't necessarily think that's limited to a younger generation either. You mentioned earlier um, what you're envious of, of our generation, what is something that looking back in your career now that, you know, you wish Pat of 10 years or 15 years ago, what is something that you know now that you wish you knew then? I think it really is patience uh, and knowing that growth is ahead. And I really wish, I know I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but I, my job is not who I am. And, and that's honestly something probably more that I learned through the last few years of the pandemic than anything. Uh, and that's not a reflection of, of the jobs that I had or the people I worked with. It's a reflection of the state of the world. And, you know, everybody's priorities shifted. And I, I really wish I would have always seen my career as a, a means to live the life that I want to live uh, and not the end goal itself. Uh, I definitely got caught up in thinking how cool it was that I worked at ESPN, put it in my Twitter bio. I was like, look how awesome I am. Um, but it, it was just a job. Uh, the, I'm forever grateful of the people that I met and the things that I learned throughout the, the stops that I've had. But at the end of the day, they are just jobs. And I, I wish if I could go back and tell myself that, uh, you know, when I was starting my career, I started as an intern at ESPN in the summer of 2007 and got hired out of that full time. As soon as I moved into that full-time role, I was, let's get promoted. Granted, the entire economy crashed in less than a year. The 2008 financial crash happened, uh, and none of us were, were promoted, uh, and there was not much hiring. But uh, it, it didn't stop me from always pushing for it. And I put a lot of undue stress on myself that I, I really wish I could, you know, I would have known that from the beginning. I'm really glad that you learned that lesson, because that is something that I learned within the past couple of years, the pandemic. Um I left, so I, I have kind of, I'll try to describe this. There's the ESPN mindset for me and there's the Spotify mindset for me. The ESPN mindset was like, I am my work. I identify with that. It was, I'm going 120%. I'm doing all the cliche things. First one in, last to leave, going in again uh, on, on a given Tuesday at ESPN, going in on the off day, off day, signing up for all the extra shifts they asked me to do, not sleeping or only getting four hours of sleep. Um, I famously walked, you know, on a snowy day, I walked the streets of Bristol because my car was in a ditch somewhere, walked to get to work so that they could rely on me. And you know, I picked up, you know, I, I did everything. I networked, I met with everyone, you know, the president of ESPN multiple times I sat down with and had conversations with. And then in the pandemic, obviously, when you don't have live sports, your bottom line is going to take a hit. So I didn't get laid off, thankfully. But I almost wish that I had been because it would have been a better situation than what they presented me with. So I started ESPN at ESPN Radio. 
Absolutely hated it. Worked there for two years. Hated every second of it. Transitioned over to podcasting. Loved every second of it. Essentially, they said, Troy, we just laid off in November 2020, laid off a bunch of radio people. Troy, we need you to go back to radio because you have all this radio experience and you need to do podcasting as well. So they were proposing that my shift on a Monday be 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. podcasting, 7 p.m. to 3 a.m. radio repeat every day. I begged and pleaded, said, I absolutely will not do that. That is, I, I don't, I have zero interest in radio, been there, done that, doesn't make sense with my trajectory whatsoever. I love what I'm doing in podcasting, it's fulfilling, et cetera, et cetera. Took this to the top of the company and was told, do it or quit. And it was at that moment where I was like, I'm figuring my stuff out and I'm quitting. And that is the last I ever gave 120% to a corporation. Fast forward to now, I love Spotify and I take a lot of pride in in working there, but I'm, you know, and I'm proud to admit that I'm not giving 120% because I know if push ever comes to shove, at the end of the day, I am just a name on a spreadsheet. And no matter how much I give to the company, and this is not just Spotify, this is in any company in the world I work for, no matter how much I give at the end of the day, it's a numbers business and all the accomplishments and achievements I have can, you know, can all be for naught if another unexpected pandemic happens and they have to let me go. So my Spotify mindset is, let me give me a me 90%, which is like most people's 110% just because of my own my own talent and, and abilities and work ethic, and just be content with that and go live a life, a meaningful life outside of that where I do thing where I lean into my passions and my hobbies and I and I hang out with people I like, and I go to Hawaii and fulfill another passion of mine. So that's kind of how I've shifted my mindset. I hope people that that listen to this or, or see your content or read your newsletter uh, really do take that lesson from you. Um, you know, I like I said, I'm forever grateful for the opportunity to learn at ESPN, but I was also in Central Connecticut for six years out of college. I spent my whole second half of my 20s living there. Uh, I worked till midnight or 3 a.m. or 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. during the Australian Open for two weeks every year. Um, and I, everybody has this vision of what working at ESPN is. It's being at the Super Bowl and going to these parties and having access and hanging out with Scott Van Pelt. Um, I've certainly taught college troops with him in the locker room at, the, at ESPN many times, but it's not this glamorous life that you maybe expect going in and uh, you don't get the time back. And I, I have so much respect for what you're doing right now. Uh, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, you might not be able to do it. You might not want to do it anymore. You, you know, you're probably, you know, your priorities will change as you go, but uh, I'm, I'm so happy for you and the way that you're pursuing this. And I still, I will still say as a manager, fully advocate people giving 100%. Once you cross that threshold into 101, 120%, you start devaluing yourself because what, what we're paying you for is hundred percent of you. We hired you for your skill set, for your knowledge, for your insight, for your ability, for your talent. That's what we want. Anything you start to give above and beyond that. And especially me on the sports side, and it's been interesting for me at Spotify, a lot of the people that I've had the opportunity to hire and, and work with over the last few years come from other sports places where they are used to working until four in the morning and working on their days off and working a football schedule. So Sundays you're on no matter what, or, you know, you're on call at all hours of the night. And it's sort of like what I've taken on as, you know, having the opportunity to manage them for a period of time is when you go on vacation, please don't respond to anything. You're going to see Slack messages. You're going to see email. I will feel worse about your time off if you respond than if you take two days to respond after you come back, like take your time to catch up uh, because this is a burnout industry. It's a burnout job um, and you really have to be cognizant of it or else it'll catch up with you. Last question for you, unrelated to most of what we talked about. Working at ESPN totally killed my passion for watching sports. I used to be a big NBA fan, college basketball fan. I used to be all over March Madness bracket, deep analysis into every 14 seed. And now I do not care one bit. The only thing I watch is the UFC, and it's because I get paid to do it. How do, You are still a very passionate sports fan. How have you maintained that? 
you know, the reason I joined Twitter initially was because I was a Pittsburgh fan living in Connecticut and I didn't have that connection with back home anymore. Uh, for me, like, you know, the Pirates, the Steelers and the Penguins were my upbringing. It's, I still don't know to this day how I ended up a big Phoenix Suns fan. It happened, I think, around Charles Barkley's MVP year. I was young. Um, I just that that's how I stay connected to people back home primarily. The Suns thing, whatever. I love basketball. It's the only sport I've ever played. Um, but the Pittsburgh connection for me is really like the number one thing. Um, I actually, I don't know. I, I would challenge whether or not it was actually the ESPN side that burned you out. I think you have to, you only have so much time in a day. And the amount of time that you have to put towards paying attention to and knowing the UFC, at some point you had to cut something else out. You don't watch movies the way that I watch movies. I, I doubt you binge TV the way that I watch TV. There's only so many hours of the day. And I think the thing that likely got cut out for you was probably some of the other sports. I grew the biggest college basketball fan in the world growing up. And I don't really watch it anymore because it, it's not because I care less about it. It's, you know, I, I don't know. I live in L.A. The games that I grew up watching, the teams I cared about play at four o'clock. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily fit my schedule anymore. Um, so there's just, you know, life becomes busier and there's less time for things. Um, but I don't know, man, sports. I love the small talk. I love being able to, you know, I run into somebody outside in a Cleveland Browns sweatshirt that I've never met before. I can fight with them in five minutes just because uh, I know that we'll disagree about football. Well, next time I see you, you can get me all hyped and ready for the next Pittsburgh Panthers football season. Uh, thank you very much for joining me, Pat. Thank you for not only joining me on the show, but for being an awesome colleague, coworker mentor and most importantly above all a friend thank you for joining me best of luck with your 18th new job title uh at spotify and i look forward to seeing you soon and uh, i'm excited for the for the new opportunity at spotify that's the last thing i'll say don't have a five-year plan don't have a 10-year plan the last like five jobs i've had didn't exist before i had them and th this industry is going to take you wherever it wants to go uh, you started in radio and now you're working in podcasting. Uh, you know, that's kind of how this goes. Uh, but Troy, uh, you've, you've been, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure for me to get to learn from you, uh, to your, your energy and your enthusiasm that you bring to this and to your full-time job is, uh, is contagious. And I know the rest of the crew that works uh, alongside you on the MMA show and everything else you touch would say the same. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity. It's been great catching up. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to us chatting again. <laughs>